we're getting a little ahead of schedule right now. We haven't gotten our stuff in from inline tube yet. So you'll see some things on it as we're putting it together. You think normally we would have in place. We just have to get this in and have to get the wheels on it, have to get it down for one reason. Larry, the upholstery guy is coming out tomorrow to install the vinyl top and he can't do it on the hoist. So that's why we're jumping the gun. Okay, I think around there we can go ahead and set right there. Nice. Gold, Jerry, gold. All right. Okay. Uh, you got your shackles handy? Yes, sir. Let's lower that bad boy down and see if we can put some shackles in. Move to the front, get the engine transmission loaded in the car. Let's get it on. All right. This week, we go through every phase of this 1970 Barracuda build as it transforms from a 318 four speed to a 446 barrel Cuda. Just over four years ago, I got a phone call from a client who had a 1970 Barracuda Grand Coupe. She had bought this for her husband for their fifth anniversary. And I believe they've been married 19 years right now. So that car has been a part of their family for at least 17 years that I, if my math, that's what I'm coming up with. He was looking to maybe get a Harley Davidson or a muscle car. Well, he loved Cuda, she knew that. So she did a little bit of sleuthing, looking around, of course, early days of the internet, and she found one down in Florida. It was a 70 Barracuda Grand Coupes, like Cousin Dougie's car. Remember I told you about his Lemon Twist Yellow 318? Well, here's kind of the ironic thing. That car was a 318 four-speed from the factory. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot to you sitting there, and maybe at home you don't realize how unusual that is, but most of the 318 cars were automatics. But to put it into perspective, 164 1970 Barracuda Grand Coupes were built with a 318 and a four-speed. So it was a rare car. Doesn't mean it's worth a lot of money, but it means it's rare. So she put a deal together to get that car and she presented it on their anniversary. She actually had two pictures, she told me, sitting on a dining room table there when he came home from work. One was of the Harley Davidson he was dreaming about and the other one was about the Barracuda. And he immediately picked up the picture and says, I'll see you in a week. <laughs> he, he went down and picked up the car himself and flatbedded it back. So when we took this vehicle in, um, we had just moved into our new shop here and I was looking to populate it as much as possible. Prior to that, we were doing one or two cars a year and I wanted to get a good healthy backlog. So I did take on a lot of cars during that time. So this was one of the cars that came in. I was definitely intrigued at the idea it was a 318 four speed, even though it wasn't gonna end life that way. It was still something really cool I could show Doug. I like to document the cars. I like to make sure that I have everything written down as this one's missing a fender tag always was. So I had to go about it more um, sleuth style where you go in and say, okay, does that footprint show that it had this transmission or this cross member or this rear end? How many holes are there in the firewall? Did it have this? But that allows me to create a database. So when guys like Dave Weiss who write the books, who by the way, just texted me a little bit ago asking my advice on something. So is what it is. Um, I like to have that data handy for him, you know? I don't need my name in a book, you know, to say, oh, you're the man. So, I have a show. We've taken the 1970 Plymouth Barracuda 318 four-speed car and converted it to his dream car, which is a 70 Cuda 446 barrel, four-speed transmission, Dana rear end. FE5 Rally Red, which ironically is the original color that car started life. They're gonna be very excited to see that car completely done. Finally, after 17 years, for the very first time, be able to drive it. Now, this little Barracuda was in pretty bad shape when we got it dipped, came back, and really got an opportunity to look it over. It, uh, it had came out of the Florida area, as I had mentioned earlier, and a lot of stuff down there, especially if it gets close to that coast, boy, it rusts. And so it had a lot of work done to it, 
but a lot of that work just needed to be redone. Maybe it was tried to keep the repairs too small back when somebody did it, or maybe it just wasn't quite the way it needed to be. Bottom line was, we had a massive undertaking. Once it came back, it was a major job. George had to work both A pillars, both of the hinge pillars, which usually are about the last thing to rust on these E-body cars. They were completely rotten, which tells you automatically that everything else pretty much from the roof down is rotten. So we ended up putting the main floor in it, the rear step wells, the under seat pan, all four frame rails, front frame rails, rear frame rails, both front aprons, the cowl, firewall, upper firewall, the roof skin. We were able to save a lot of the roof reinforcement, which is good because nobody makes it, but a lot of that was repairable. The inner and outer wheelhouses, quarter panels, trunk floor, the trunk floor extensions, the rear body panel, the Dutchman panel. I mean, really, literally, you could almost pull out an AMD catalog and go through it and say, here's all the pieces that we had to replace on it. But it's what we do. That's what happened on our Phantom Coot. If you go back and you look at the guys that helped us out back at the installation center, they pretty much started the same way where you just have like a section of the roof hanging in the air and maybe a pillar sticking up here and one there and you build it out from there. That's what we do. So in that particular case, that car needed a lot of sheet metal on it, a lot of love to get it to a point where it could get moved over to the mudroom. But we have a good team of guys and they did a great job. Once we signed off on it, it was in a situation where it could go over there and start getting smoothed out. With that many panels being replaced on a car, you really have to take your time and QC everything. There's, everything can move. So you may have a quarter that's where it's supposed to be or it looks like it is, but make sure that the door goes up against it. Make sure that the new hinge pillar that they put in isn't a quarter inch forward or backwards, which is hard to make a mistake like that, but it can happen. But once I had an opportunity to go around the car and make sure, once I had an opportunity to go around the car and make sure everything was where it was supposed to be and I had good gaps and good lines on it, I could send it over to the mudroom. We were pretty far behind even at that point, so it didn't spend a lot of time in there. In fact, I think it went through it so fast we didn't even get footage of it going there. I think I snapped a few pictures about it. But with good new sheet metal like what we had, it was really easy to smooth out. And as soon as it was smoothed out, we could move it over to Will. Once he took over, then it really started becoming a car again. Once that red paint starts flying around, it becomes real. You've never used that word in that context before. Is this a new one for you? What, wax poetically? Yeah. Okay. Yeah? About what part? Uh, I kind of talk about the production numbers for the future of that year. Uh, you can think of me about the word in the So if you wanna jump into the nerd numbers on this particular car, it started life as a Grand Coupe. That's a BP, first two digits of the VIN is a BP. Then it is a 23G318, okay? It's a 1970 model. This car with the factory manual four-speed D21 transmission, they made 164 of these cars. Total, that's the total number they made of the Grand Coupe 318 four-speed. We converted it to look like a 70 Cuda 446 barrel four-speed with a Dana track pack FE5 Rally Red. Of the 446 barrel four speed 70 Kudas, they made 902. They actually made a lot more of those than they did the, what this car started life as, but it's also a lot more desirable. So that that's kind of that reverse math that doesn't always make sense, but if you're familiar with the Mopars, you know how it can make sense. Well, that looks very good. Is it coming off pretty easy? What's that? Is it coming off pretty easy? Yeah, a little bit. The pre-paints, you know, I, I go back and forth, forth with it. Sometimes I love it, sometimes I hate it. But ultimately, I love doing it because there is no shrink back, there is no swelling, there is no issues in the final paint. The car's covered, makes the final paint job go that much quicker. And if, you know, we're, we're all human, so if you do make a mistake and you see something that you missed, you see it in the pre-paint. Fix it up a little bit, put it in the booth and that final paint just comes out beautiful every time. We have a new guy that had just started. I took, took him, kind of showed him some of the issues that need to be addressed in the engine compartment, which basically 
stripping it down to bare metal was just the best way to start and you can really see what you're working with. Now that the engine compartment's completely stripped, I can really go through, assess the metal, really look at all the little details because it's a camera area, so you do see engine compartments. You see about 50% of them, but it does look good. A couple things I'll take the new guy through, kind of show him what I want to do. We'll get those things addressed and then move on to the next process. That all looks really good. So next, we'll level the car out and then I'll have you start inside the cab. You don't have to strip it down to bare metal, but I'll get you a DA and kind of show you what the inside of this looks like. I like doing new colors. So this is the first time I've done a Rally Red. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous color. It pops. This car is going to be stunning when it was done. Uh, there, When I came back, there was one that was already done by the former crew. It was just a gorgeous car all the way around. So it does make it more exciting when you're doing a fresh color that you have not done. And when you roll it over there with some of the other great colors we have in the assembly shop, this is really going to pop with the rest of them. So you don't need to strip this down like you did the engine compartment, but all these little grinder marks that he made, they need to be sanded back. So that way when the paint goes on top of it, it just looks cleaner. On the inside of these marks, super anal, that the inside looks just as good as the outside. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's awesome. So we just gotta spend the extra time doing it. I mean, you, it gets dynamat over it, the carpet, you never see any of it, but he's still really, really picky about all of it looking just as good. In case somebody ever takes it apart, and they could look in there and say, holy crap, they actually do a lot of detail work in there. Yeah. So this is our DA. Um, and you really can't mess this up. It's pretty self-explanatory. We do have some Bondo work to do, which I'll show you as we get further on in the process. But right now, it's just about getting all this sanded so the paint sticks and getting rid of all this crap here. So I've... by taking the extra time to just address these little things, it makes it to where when we actually do the paint work on the jams, it looks just like the outside of the car. So it's just overall just a better quality for us. It gives us a better name, reputation, and the car just lasts that much better. And it just makes you more proud. Factory didn't do that. And a lot of resto shops don't do that now. But by painting every square inch, it'll never rust. These cars are covered top to bottom. So it's just the best and safest way to go. Okay, so uh, what we're doing right now is gapping these points to 17 thousandths. Put it up on the high point on the lobe, open the points up to 17 thousandths, and uh, lock the screw down. Okay! Ha ha! There's my man, my toucan Sam, my can of spam, my green eggs and his name! Ham! Green eggs and ham. Yeah, that's him, that's what, what he does absolutely what? every time. You don't understand, you cannot wait to get the punchline out. If you know how the punchline goes and the poor guy telling the story is building it up real good, you'll slice those legs right up from underneath him and spew out the, the, the punchline. You do the same thing with songs too. I'm just out here to ask you a simple question. Last night got down to 30 some degrees. That's cold. Shotgun mic on, testing, one, two, three. That's cold. Yeah, 30, yeah. 32 degrees. We ought to check things like Christine and the Little Dead Wagon and the other customer cars that still have the numbers matching engines in them until they got sent to us to make sure that they don't freeze. Like, do you have a way of checking the antifreeze? I have an antifreeze tester here somewhere. I doubt I could find it. Well, when you buy the next one, because that's what, that's, I just have that coming, that I just go buy tools, this guys just lose them. Could you go outside and check all the cars that have engines in them? Make sure they're all prepared for the winter, long winter's nap. Yeah, 32 degrees, I think now's a good time to check them. I em. think it is too. It's what we call frost or freezing. Uh-huh. My windshield was iced over pretty hard this morning. Yep. Took me 15 minutes to get cleared off. It's over too this morning. And you know the first thing I thought? Uh-uh. God, I wonder about all the cars at the shop. I wonder if they've been winterproofed. Okay, I'll, I'll go check them, Mark. Thanks, Doug. You're welcome. You're the best. Anybody seen crazy? <laughs> what? You're in the booth right now with us. We have all of our fenders and our doors for our 1970 Cuda that's going rally red. Uh, so now we're gonna kick you guys out of here and get the color going on these parts. I need to come in here, seam seal, just two of the seams that I had forgotten to do. Luckily, we caught that before we painted it. This just prevents from, uh, seam seal on that, that. It's a pretty good size seam that's right there. So by seam sealing it, it allows it not to, uh, when it rains, water doesn't get down in your dash area or inside the floorboard. So they just kind of went through, 
brush it on there quick, all assembly line type stuff. Just get it done, nothing fancy. Paint won't stick to bare metal. So anything that's bare metal, you have to etch prime first. So you put that etch primer on there and it literally is just like it says, it does etch to the bare metal and then the paint will stick to the primer. And it's just a two to one mix. And then I usually do like a half a reducer just to thin it down just a little bit. So it sprays better. So since this car started life as a FE5 Rally Red, that's exactly what the owner wanted to keep it, which I, I, that's the stuff I really love. Yeah, we're gonna convert it, we're gonna take it from a 318 and make it into a six barrel car, but let's try to keep some originality in there. You know, it's kind of a tip of the hat to Chrysler. It's time to get the single stage mixed up and make it red. And the car is going Rally Red. It's a gorgeous color. We haven't done it in quite a few years, uh, but and we're doing it in a single stage. So it does go a little bit quicker, so you're not having to actually do it base coat, clear coat. You go in three or four coats and you're completely done. So in this case, he wanted a FE5 Rally Red. This was the first time Will ever painted Rally Red. Now it's not a difficult color. It's not a metallic. The only real difficulty with it is reds can be transparent. Even in the fine PPG paint that we use, they can be a little transparent. It's just as important to do the inside of the engine compartment as nice as the outside of the car. So it's one of those high camera areas that just has to look perfect from start to finish. If it takes five coats to cover on a spray out card, it'll take five coats to cover on the door. The advantage to what we do by painting everything twice is the fact that that first five or six coats that you put on there, you look at it, it's beautiful, bring it out, let it cure, you long block it with 800 and then you walk around it again. It just guarantees a really perfect finish. And that's what we ended up with on that car. Once I get the engine bay wrapped up, we'll hop inside, get the cab done, and then we'll get the trunk done. Then at that point, we can hang this whole thing together, start blocking it for final paint. The lines are beautiful. The color is rich and it's deep. It's original. And this is actually a concept single stage paint. This is not a base coat clear coat. This is their concept PPG. It's a polyurethane paint and it is just, looks like you can stick your hands right into it. Got the engine compartment completely sprayed. That Rally Red single stage covered pretty quick. Looks gorgeous. So at that point, we'll let this just sit in the booth and do its thing and dry. And then as we move forward, we'll get the cab done, inside the trunk done, get the car put together completely, block it out, clean it all up, make sure the car looks perfect, and then do our final paint job on it. Go ahead and start screwing those in. And you can just tell the fender's gonna line up into place beautiful. It's a five minute job, G. We should have this done two days ago, but you weren't here to film. And there's a lot of people at home that want to see you on TV. Because you, you remind the people of like a happy time in their life when like Lucky Charms came out. Yeah, you make people think of their childhood. Yeah. And your little pot of gold. No, no pot of gold. Okay. I do not Those little gold remember. coins? No. I guess, I guess I'm Does just kind of getting old. No, you're a leprechaun. They don't age, remember? You're not getting old. You stay at age forever. Like, you'll look the same. Like for my grandkids and their grandkids, they'll probably still be working here. Well, it doesn't mean I'm not gonna get memory loss. No, you don't age. If you watch Leprechaun, they stay the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like a vampire. Oh. Only red. Well, I don't know if I can honestly complain and about that. So me and Will just got done hanging. It's Will and I. If you're gonna talk, use pr proper English, dude. Me and Will, it's Will and I. Haven't you already discussed Focus. that I'm a Leprechaun? So the leprechaun over here cannot speak proper English. I'm sorry at home, but we just got done hanging the CUDA together back there. It was quite fun. I mean, it went together. There was some little quirks. We had to adjust some things, but I mean, I'm very happy. We didn't scratch the paint. It can go over to him. He can finish up everything. And I don't see no major things holding us back. I don't see no major things. So the FE5 Rally Red, uh, you'll see that on quite a few muscle cars. It was popular. Not necessarily as popular as the FC7, which is the Plum Crazy or the Inviolate. That was the number one color on all muscle cars for Chrysler in 1970. But I bet the FE5 Rally Red or Bright Red in the Dodge lineup probably wasn't far behind it. And so when I look at that car, even though I love to give him crap and tell him I'm a better painter, he, he is a great painter now, despite how much I try to keep him down, hold him down, put him down, beat him down. That's my job, that's what I do. You remember at the end of uh, 48 Hours, the original one, Nick Nolte kind of leans over and says, yeah, all that. And he says a bunch of stuff to him, just keeping you down, doing my job. 
That's all I was doing. It's my job. McNulty. I can't use the same words he did. They were very un ugly words. Oh, boy. Hey, we have antifreeze. That's a good thing. Got some nice antifreeze here. Antifreeze tester. Is that enough for all the cars Mark just listed? No. Let's get this done quickly so we can get back to what we're supposed to be doing. Is it cold outside? Yes. Can I put a coat on? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, man. Here's how we put our coat on. There we go. I'm going in. Going in cold. Where's my glove? Where's my mittens? Has anyone seen my mittens? is all complete on our 1970 Rally Red Cuda. I've rolled it outside where I'll get it all pressure washed before we go ahead with the undercoating and blacking out the taillight panel. This color looks good on probably every car. You want it in the second stall here? Yeah, that works. Are right, you clear? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Isn't that pretty? Yeah, that looks great. It's nice to see a new car over here, especially a new color, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's a pretty straight car. Nice bright color. Yeah. And that's straight. That looks really good. Thank you. Uh, so right now, I have Doug and Ezra over there in the assembly shop building out Sipes' rear end for his Cuda. Originally, when I spoke with the owners about the car, um, I knew they didn't have just like multiple dollars to throw at. I mean, they're a working family, they're salt of the earth kind of people. <clears throat> so originally, my budget didn't have to put the Dana in it. Uh, all four 44 speeds would have had a Dana rear end in them in 1970 or earlier and later. As I was building the car, especially the fact that we were running over on our time and they'd been so gracious, I thought, nah, I wanna finish this car out really righteous for them. So I got hold of the guys at Mosier and I put in a 354 Dana just like it would have had from the factory with the 446 barrel. Could have gone with a 410 Dana, but I wanted a 354 so it'd be very drivable. But that's one of the little surprises. I don't know if they know yet, but they will when they pick up the car. So when the 70 Barracuda was introduced, it was brand new. It was brand new to the market. It was built on an E-body platform. It was wider, sleeker, lower, great looking car. The earlier ones, the 69 and back, which we have some here, they were a small bodied car. They weren't nearly as cool, as sleek, as sexy as the 1970. When the, when the 70 came out, it had so many new features and it just grabbed you. I mean, it literally, if you walked into a show, well, if you walked into a showroom and you saw that car sitting there, you would want to buy that car. Now, here's what I've done for my little friends at home here. This is what I do. I've got a fertile mind, my mother used to say. I put together a little video for you using some of the old original footage from the original Insight videos that were made by Chrysler that we have access to and put it together with a little bit of GYC twang. So this is where you'll cut out where I'm talking right now. You kind of fade to black. 
and then slip the J and then bring in the video. So, and don't leave all that in there, obviously. New, now, Barracuda. Here's what it's all about. This power hood with simulated air scoops and functional hood locking pens is standard on CUDA except for the Hemi CUDA. The all new shaker hood for Hemi CUDA is the last word in performance hoods. Also optional with 340 and 446 barrel, the air cleaner actually shakes in the hood opening at idle. The shaker hood fresh air induction system delivers maximum performance heavy-duty suspension that has a front anti-sway bar, heavy-duty torsion bars, heavy-duty shocks, heavy-duty rear leaf springs, 11-inch brakes, and F70 by 14-inch white lettered tires. Solid. Combined with a new wide stance makes CUDA hang on the road like mother love. What else makes up CUDA? 9,000 candle power road lamps, standard hood lock pins, rib design sill molding, black rear deck panel, and chrome exhaust tips, all standard. Standard on all Barracudas, the new fully synchronized three-speed manual transmission with floor-mounted shift. Four-speed manual and torque flight are optional. Console mounted with a slapstick gate, the automatic shifter that makes speed shifts a slap. Now the story on some of the other great features of all Barracuda models. Every inch of sheet metal is new. The grille and front end treatment is distinctive and original. New sharply raked windshield features, concealed wipers, ventless side glass enhances the appearance and improves driver's visibility. New recessive door handles provide maximum convenience and security in the rear. New triple tail lights set horizontally and red bumpers, a new option. Tough plastic covered and painted to match the body. Two bumper packages are offered. A offers the front bumper in nine body colors and twin racing mirrors in five body colors and chrome. B offers red bumpers front and rear and twin red racing mirrors and five exciting new performance colors. Limelight, vitamin C, lemon twist, in violet, and tour red are another way our owners can personalize their Barracuda. Another Barracuda feature is the curbside rear deck lock. Now you can open the trunk from the sidewalk. Three great series, six fabulous models, nine spectacular engines, three transmissions plus slapstick with console. The car that's calling all America with this invitation. Let me show you what driving is all about. I, I don't typically, like, it's not in my DNA to be regretful, all right? So, but that doesn't mean you're not mindful, all right? I guess what I'm saying is, when I took that car on, number one is I, you know, I didn't have the opportunity to see everything. I, I wish I could have seen everything. And it really wouldn't be probably that I would make the price any different because I really wanted to make it happen for the people. I think that was the most important part of it, but I probably would have just given myself like oodles amount of time <laughs> more than I did. So I, I guess if that's a regret, it's that. But I don't think that typically speaking, you can regret necessarily things that you've done if you did them in a good spirit and you weren't out to hurt anybody. Okay, so people do things that are bad and they should regret them. And if they don't, they're sociopaths. So Ted, Ted Bundy the guy, you know, sociopath didn't, our camera guy is sociopath. But for me, my biggest thing is I have a big heart. And so when I make a mistake, like in this case, and underestimate the time by a couple of years, and I, and we have some out there like that, then I feel like, you know, I, I didn't fulfill my obligation as the dream maker, because the dream maker, he got to make everybody dream come true and everybody happy, but people tend to get less happy when it takes too long to do their cars. If I look back and I'm reflective about it, I think, okay, one is, and now today when we take a car on, I'm much more liberal with the time and say, I cannot control so many things. There's so many parts on a car 
that I don't have the opportunity or the insight or the knowledge, and I haven't been down that road to find out what all I'm going to be missing. I just have to say, we're gonna be prudent. We're gonna work on it on a steady basis. At the end of the day, you're gonna have a beautiful car, but what I can't do is paint myself into a corner about time. So looking back, I just wish I would have had the knowledge, and we do that in life anyway. That's hindsight's 2020. And then I think that at that point, if you tell somebody that, they have the opportunity. Say, look, I want you to do it, but I ain't got four years. You know, I, I just don't. Because there are shops that probably could do it quicker. I wouldn't say they do it better. They probably wouldn't do it as good, but they could do it quicker. They probably wouldn't do it any cheaper either, to be quite honest with you. I keep our prices way in line compared to some of our competition that's out there and we don't have a lot, but the guys that are in there swinging the bat with us in the cage, they're double our numbers in price. I have one advantage that my competitors don't have, okay? And that is that I have a television show. And I know, I know the networks don't get happy when I talk like this and you guys can edit it out if you want to, but because we are in that position and because we don't ever say something that's not true, I won't put a part on a car if you give it to me, I couldn't care less. If I don't like the part, I'm not gonna put it on the car because it's the people and my reputation that I have to worry about. But people do want to work with you and they are more amicable and you can find yourself getting a better discount than the guy down the road. One is we do a lot of cars and a lot of parts, so we should get a good discount. But the show doesn't hurt anything as well. And so at the end of the day, I am able, I could put that all those savings in my little jeans and build a big house on the hill and, and drive around in a fancy car but I don't, I put it all back into the business and my focus for my business is to get the cars done to best of my ability while I have time to do it in my life. And I don't, and I'll never regret that. If you wanna know I got any regrets? Sure, but that's not one of them. So really for me, yeah, I like to reflect. I like to try to learn from my mistakes and, and move forward. One thing that helps me move forward is when a beautiful car is coming out. This is a beautiful car. This car was in dire straits. It was done. Every piece of sheet metal bar, maybe eight or nine, was replaced on the car. And now here it is, a beautiful replica of an original V-code, one of 902 446 barrel four-speed cars. I mean, this is truly the moment that's the best for me. This is the one that pays off the best. Doesn't matter if you made money, doesn't matter if you lost money. It matters that you took too long, but at the same time, those feelings go away really quick when you're sitting behind one of the best restored cars in the world. Putting the assembly line markings on it, checking out all the final gaps on it, running the engine, making sure that everything works right, road testing it, going out, those feelings that you are just now rebooting this car's life for hopefully another 50 years. So that's about the most rewarding feeling a person can have. And, that, and for me, somebody who's a car guy and who loves the brand, the only Mopar uh, brand advocate, I didn't know if the new viewers knew that or not, but they know, okay. Well, it's a couple of years ago at SEMA I was presented, so. And it's not important that you leave that in there, but point is I'm the brand ambassador. So what was your question? So, so one of the things that I like to do is, so one of the things that I pretty much require, at least they say lead by example, don't, don't screw around right then. If you're, if you, I mean, there's plenty of time for jokes, right? I believe that jokes are very important. I think they build morale, but when you're putting an engine in a hundred thousand dollar car, that's probably not the time to be goofing around and playing if I can say that word. I think I can, is that on the sensor list? Yeah. Yes, a bleep ass. Oh, that's ridiculous. Get my lawyer. I'm calling Johnny Cochran. Okay. Um. 
One of the things the client wanted on this car was the optional, it was, well, didn't start life on this car, but you could get it, was the rubber bumper. But there's a guy, Tommy the Cryco. I love Tommy the Cryco. I met him at SEMA a few years ago and he said he was gonna start making them, and he does. We've pre-fitted on the car and it fit better than the factory ones did. The original factory ones still had problems. A lot of times they weren't wide enough and they they just suck up right against the body and it would cause it to chafe and rub the paint off. This fit beautiful. Other than just finishing some of the edges that needed to be sanded out, it was a beautiful part. So yeah, I gave it the green light, gave it my blessing to get it painted red and put it on the car. And boy, it really does set off that car. Hey, uh, okay, the thing that we mentioned earlier about the Mike Cousin Vinny, Okay, so Mark's brilliant idea of the week. He wants to recreate large portions of my cousin Vinny. You know about the Yamaha we're building for SEMA? I, I don't. Yeah. That's next year's project? Yep, 1972 Dodge van. It's already in the works. Are you gonna finish this year's project maybe first? He's been okay. around ODL a little too long. It, so no, no, it's just, you. I think a legitimate question. You, you mean, okay. How can I help you help me? Okay, I looked at What into courthouse a... did you find to do it with? Okay, courthouse I called. Do uh, it the... We can't actually shoot there. Um, no, that's the one we're doing it in because that's the one that looks exactly like the one of my cousin Vinny. How have you been in that courthouse? Uh, I've like been in a... that courthouse when I was a kid because I wasn't a spooner like you. I didn't have everything handed to me. I didn't have the facts everything handed to me. This is that Wahlberg stuff I was talking oh, about. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. No, that's a good ratio. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you, right. got the, yeah. you got that. The courthouse was. That's yeah, done. That's not okay, happen, did you but... get the, tra the actor? Uh, Doug's going to Oh, acting. Doug's acting lessons. And Alyssa. Uh, I haven't and Tony gotten to that. Yeah, they all. Get all, all of you guys need acting lessons. And that's okay. you as well, I'm assuming. So I don't need any. I don't um, know that. Do you wash those? Yeah, I wash them. Okay. Okay. Why don't you not worry about that? And worry a lot more about. Yeah. So yeah. Back to the my list. Okay. So the, the 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 period clothing's a little weird because that's Marissa like 1992, Tomei. you know. And I don't know about that, but uh, we're, okay, it sounds to me like you're doing an awful lot of pushing back. Well, no, I'm just saying that. Over the years, we've all encountered a lot of different ways that Mark tries to end an, an argument or a discussion and, and sort of get the last word in. Uh, his go-to things are insults, but he's the director. So I don't care, he's not directing this. Talking over you. I, I thought, you wanted, I'm directing I thought you wanted to direct I'm directing this. Movie quotes. You're okay, gonna, so Stallone directs you're all gonna of You're gonna direct it and starring, are you, uh, today was the trump card. He just started taking off his pants. There goes the button. No, I'm, I'm, I got other things Here to do. Here goes the zipper. I, no, I gotta ready? deliver an episode. I'm going. Of, but I just want to let care. you know. They that can blur that's... it. So one of my favorite parts is the road test. It's really the last thing you have to do. You have to get that car out, put it through the paces, and make sure, make sure everything functions like it should. Because one of the things I put in my agreements is that I will put the car back in its original assembly line condition relative to safety, function, and appearance. And that's all three. That's the big three. That's the trinity. Not to get biblical on you, but that's the big one. So I'm looking forward to getting out and driving that car. So we're just taking the CUDA out on our maiden voyage. We just finished all of the undercarriage markings and installation of the decals. So this is the first time we get to get it out on the road. So far, so good. We just left the shop. Boy, these old gearboxes, man, they are just noisy as heck. I mean, it's not a bad noisy. So there's first gear, feels good. Second, nice shift. Jamie back there at Pass On did the four speed in this. We needed a date code of 70 Hemi four speed. So he had one there and he built it out for us. It shifts nice. A lot of times these are a little harder to shift, but this thing's just beautiful. There's fourth gear. And boy, it wants to go. You can feel it. There's just a little bit of acceleration. Nice. Just kind of got to run through a few things before you can really play with it much. So right now I'm just making sure the brakes work, the clutch works, everything works like it's supposed to. Make sure I look handsome on camera. Steering's working nice. Let's open up those secondaries a little. Sounds good. Sounds healthy. It's the way they're supposed to. So that thing's when it's idling around, just so you folks know, 
It's running on the center carburetor until I stomp it to the floor. Center carburetor is 350 cubic feet per minute. The outboards are 500 each. So under full acceleration, foot to the wood, everything on, it's 1,350 cubic feet per minute. So you guys that had 780 Holly double pumper dual feeds back in the day, and you had an 800 or you had a, maybe you had one of those great big three barrels, nothing, nothing compared to 1,350 CFM. Feels good, holds the road well. Got a little bit of a pull to the left. I'm gonna have to do something about that. If it was pulling to the right, I'd say it's the crown in the road, but if it's pulling to the left, probably out of alignment just a little bit. So going through the corners, I set these up at about two degrees of caster. That's the most we can get out of it, positive caster. And that allows it to hug the road real nice and for the steering wheel to turn back like it's supposed to. All the gauges are working. We have fuel, temperature, oil pressure. Amp gauge is working, it's charging. Tachometer's working great. Speedometer's working. Even our digital clock's working great. This is the dash that we sent out to Instrument Specialties. They did a nice job on it. One of the things I like about their work is they're not just throwing decals on gauges and saying, oh, it's restored like some butchers do. They're actually redoing all of it. They're redoing the lettering. They're redoing the gauges. They're calibrating everything so that it works correctly. It's a really nice, tight feel. No rattles when you go over the uh, railroad tracks, that's good. You want to put it through the bump test because that's when, if an exhaust system is a little bit too tight, uh, it'll rattle against the floor of the car. Those are the times that you want to pick that stuff up. Well, speaking of the exhaust, so this is our first system that we've used uh, ECS for. And it's a great sounding system, but the best thing about it is it's an absolute 100% spot on duplicate of the original one with all the vendor codes, date codes, all the stuff's on them. So, so far on the road test, everything's working like it's supposed to. The brakes feel a little tight. They might have the shoes adjusted up a little bit too far. I can feel a drag. So like right now we're on a hill, I let off the brake and I don't feel it rolling. So I know I need to back those off a little bit. So when you spend that long on a car, probably the most rewarding part of the entire thing is being able to call the owner and say, it's done. It's officially done. I've checked it off fly out, check it out, we'll send it home. That's a great feeling. It also means another car gets to move up in the queue, which is even a better feeling. And if we could do 20 of those a year, we'd be sitting on top of the world, ma. Top of creation, looking down in the only explanation. What's that song? Love that is found every century.